be in the call today and also so that you can refresh your memory on some of the brilliant things that you're going to hear. I will be running a moderated session for some 40 minutes where we will go through three key sections. We'll get to know our panelists in a bit more detail. And we will also get some of their views on um, life going forward, some broader themes. And then we will have an opportunity for all of the audience to ask their own questions to each or all of the panelists. And I will signal to you when you should start sending your questions in to the Zoom chat. Altogether, we're expecting today's program to last somewhere between an hour and 10, an hour and 25 minutes. And we're looking forward to an awesome day. That said, let's start with some context setting, dear panelists. We're going to be reflecting on your leadership journey. So I'm going to start with a question around asking you to really reflect on some of the pivotal moments and decisions that characterize your journey to date and how your being a woman influenced the way that these moments turned out. So I'd like to start with Dr. Duca. It'd be great to hear from you. All right. So um so in terms of uh, my my journey, um, well, I guess I'll just start yeah, from undergrad and um, you know being um, pretty um, assured of my um, career path, um, but then coming upon obstacles um, and assumptions. Um, you know, I graduated college in the '90s, and um, being pre med, um, I went to the University of Virginia, and so. There was uh, commonly a, um, uh, you know, uh, a misconception that, you know, if you couldn't make it in uh, being, you know, if you couldn't make it into med school, that oftentimes women um, who were pre med were told, oh, you know, just just go to nursing school because, you know, um, you know, uh, being a doctor is tough, and so uh, a lot of women don't don't survive. Only one in three get in, and so you know, trying uh, early on having to uh, uh, battle and deal with kind of sex, sexism and stereotypes about, you know, what women's role should be, you know, in healthcare and, um, you know, trying to overcome and, and just being, you know, self-determined and, and confident in my abilities. So early on, you know, those, um, you know, that, that being, um, uh, you know, confident and assured and, and you know, finding the, the right support and finding um, mentor mentors um, that were women, and even you know, I, I I along the way I had some very supportive male mentors that really you know helped to support um, me throughout the journey, uh, throughout many stages of, of my career. Great, thank you so much, Doc. Um, Nana, Welcome. I'd be good to hear from you also. Um, some reflections on your journey. So the same question, some reflections on your journey, thinking about what were pivotal moments and how yeah. your being can influence some of your decisions or some of the outcomes that you see today. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so um, not to be too much of a plug for, for Columbia, but I will say that when I left the Navy and went to business school, um, that really was a pretty pivotal decision that definitely has affected my uh, career. Um, and then choosing to go into finance as well. So I was coming from, um, you know, an overwhelmingly male environment in the military to a pretty male environment in finance. And so for me personally, while there's, you know, there's, there's lots of environments like that. So, so I, don't, I don't call it out for any other reason to say that it does create cultures um, that I do think um, inform how you think about leadership, how you think about um, engaging, how you think about your voice in a space. Um, and so I think all of those things um, really have been formed by the fact that I, I've worked in a lot of male dominated um, areas. And I think just understanding a little bit more of the environment after business school and, and getting a sense to like, test out a few things, get to know people in different areas, um, for me was very helpful and very pivotal. Thank you. 
Um, Nanama, Cassandra, it'd be brilliant to hear from you guys as well. So in that order. Thanks, Adra. Um, I would say my leadership journey so far has been pretty organic. Um, I feel as though I've had a number of opportunities that have come my way and um, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to take advantage of them. Um, and so it, it feels, looking back on it, it feels as though I've just gone from one step to another. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not been, it, it has not been without challenges, but it does feel very, it feels very organic. Um, and I would say being a woman has been central to a lot of the decisions that I've made. I had children in law school. I had a child in law school. Um, and, and so, you know, that really shaped how I organized myself, uh, what choices I made in terms of the, um, the companies that I worked with. Um, and it's really shaped the way that I have built my law firm. Um, I think a lot of the experiences that I have had as a woman, I've been very fortunate, but I have faced sexism as well. A lot of that has helped me to understand um, you know, what it is to, to be in a minority position. And I think that has helped me to be um, a more empathetic leader, at least I hope so. Great, thanks. Um, Cassandra? Yeah, I, I think on my side, um, about 12 years ago, I made a decision to pivot my career to focus on meaningful work. And meaningful to me is not a static point. If I think of the last uh, few sets of pivotal decisions I've made in my career, um, they really sort of been around trying to figure out what does meaningful mean to me. So um, I made a decision, I think, when I finished undergrad, I did my undergrad in finance and international business, and I worked in finance for a bit. Um, and it was great. But, you know, to just con contextualize from a, a female perspective, I was the first black and female person to be on this graduate rotational leadership development program and for for my parents it was quite uh you know it, it was quite I guess a, a great thing for me to be on and it was great for me as well but a couple of years into it I realized that while it was great and it was rewarding financially it didn't really speak to me in the way I wanted it to speak to and I went on an introspective journey that led me to go to Colombia and eventually to pivot my career to to Africa. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah, and and so when I think of the role that being a female has played and and how I I, I make decisions, I, I think it's really been similar to what Nama was saying. Um, trying to build a more inclusive, equitable, and and resilient leadership style that speaks to some of the experiences I had, uh, not to say that I, I did feel excluded from certain conversations, but I, I do think that there are always ways to, um, to bring more voices into the equation and to do so in a manner that really allows people to also be authentic to themselves. And I think that that is one thing that I, I do strive to do to try and, and lead from that, that lens. Thank you all. These were a brilliant set of responses. And I'm going to start following up with you on each, each, each of you on some specific points. So I'll go back to you, Ajwa. Um, I think you shared a really interesting story about being resilient in the face of naysayers and still chasing a dream. I think it would be great if you could unpack for us what were some of the tools that you used to keep yourself going what were some of the things that, what were some of the mistakes that you made um, that looking back you would, you would like to have changed? And what were some of the things that you did that you're proud of that you, you stuck to that course? Mm. Um, okay, so let's see. So looking back, um, you know, some decisions that I made that I think were in, in, impactful in my um, whole journey, uh, like I mentioned, just being, you know, really confident and um, and really acknowledging, yes, yeah, so, so you know, challenges and mistakes along the way, um, you know, even thinking about, uh, you know, selecting my major and um, deciding what activities to participate in, um, you know, even if, if, if I uh, 
you know, wasn't as successful as I'd like to be. Um, just, you know, always, you know, persevering and realizing that, you know, um, like this is not the end of my story and, you know, it, it won't be necessarily like a, an easy road, but just, you know, realizing, you know, what um, my goals were and even um, 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 being um, um, able to, to chart a, a new path. Like for example, I was a sociology major and I was pre-med. So, you know, I wasn't the typical uh, like pre-med student who was, you know, biology or chemistry. Um, you know, I, I kind of like heated to um, the, the, the kind of um, the, the thought that I wanted, to, you know, to be a well-rounded um, applicant and to be more, um, you know, just uh, more holistic is to, you know, have like a liberal arts training. So I, I never really uh, limited myself. And, um, you know, I took um, advantage of every opportunity, even um, whether it's leadership um, or participating in, you know, groups like I was uh, the secretary of this African Caribbean club and, you know, still maintained uh, my pre-med studies and, um, you know, always was open, open to, to new challenges and, um, you know, even studying nutrition before I started med school. So, you know, it's definitely important to, even if you have challenges along the way and, and another, um, um, you know, I wouldn't even call it a mistake, but, but um, I didn't, uh, like right after undergrad, I actually took a year off and um, then I, I did a, a post back program and then I, I started my master's in nutrition before I went to med school. So you know, just really um, being open to different opportunities and, um, you know, being a woman, you know, I, I remember one time there was a, a doctor who said to me, uh, you know, uh, at one point, you know, I've, I've had so many different hairstyles, but uh, a senior doctor told me that, oh, you know, you don't even look like a, a like you're gonna be a doctor. You look like you're gonna be like a beautician. <laughs> Cause you know, I, I, I like to have my hair styled. I, I like to, you know, dress and, and be, <laughs> you know, fashionable. Just because you're 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 smart and studious, you don't have to look like a nerd or be you know like, like raggedy, but you know so just kind of dealing with all these kind of like stereotypes and 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 per perceptions and you know people who would question your intelligence, but really you know being conf confident in your ability was uh, definitely instrumental. Thanks so much for sharing. So what I'm hearing from you is really staying open and mm -hmm. making sure that openness is matched with activity. So making sure that yeah. you are present in different spaces and looking for the opening. A follow-up mm -hmm. question, quick follow-up, and then I'll move on to Jana. So the question in my mind is, if you are staying open, how do you know you're still on course? Mm. So, um, you know, uh, as, as long as, you know, you're open and you're, you're accomplishing your targets, you know, um, you know, you're you're uh, you're getting in your applications on time. You're, um, you know, um, maintaining, um, you know, camaraderie, camaraderie, and collaborating with your colleagues and um, your advisors. So as long as you're meeting your targets, and even if you know you um, you had a detour, like I like I said, for me, I didn't go straight into graduate school or to med school, and um, you know, so just being open. And even when I, I ended up at Columbia doing my master's in public health, at that point in time, I had, you know, I had finished my, my hospital residency training. And, um, you know, I actually did not want to get my master's in public health, but it was because of a fellowship in women's health um, that was based in, in uh, at Montefiore at a, a really esteemed hospital that, you know, they literally would pay for us to get our master's in public health at Columbia. And so, you know, I, at first I said, you know what, um, I think I'm going to pass because <laughs> I'm fine with, um, with uh, you know, just being a physician. But, you know, when I kind of like uh, spoke to my director and I, I became more open and I realized that, okay, there's, you know, some amazing opportunities that could await. So, so, yeah. Great. Thank you. So, Nana, um, you said you, you highlighted a really pivotal moment, which was when you decided to go to business school. And one of the things you said was you paid attention to the culture in business school, the culture in finance, and especially to understanding the cultures. 
I think for me, it'd be, uh, it'd be good to understand what was behind this deliberateness, right? So why did you pick finance? And why did you decide that I want to understand the culture? What were you looking for? And how then did it shape the way you approached opportunities? Yeah. Um, so I, I chose finance. Um, really, it, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm very interested in entrepreneurial type ventures. And so um, quite honestly, there was that, that little piece in wealth management inside of finance that, that actually sounded like the most entrepreneurial thing um, that I had heard about at school, you know, except for going to a startup. Um, and so I was really fascinated by that. And so it's, it's different than investment banking. It's different than trading and sales, but, um, but really still a pretty meaningful part of, of finance. And so for me, I, I think honestly, just being a first generation kid, being a black woman, there's always this desire to try to figure out how are you going to fit in because, you know, often you're the only one. And so for me, it, it's, it's always interesting and um, necessary to figure out like what is the culture and and how does it work and try to observe it as much as possible. I, I do wish I probably had found people a little earlier who could have helped me interpret a lot of these cultures a little bit uh, more carefully and clearly. Um, mm -hmm. But I definitely in this in in the number of years that I've been out for you know 20 years, um, I, I definitely learned a lot. And so to me it was learning cultures in order to figure out how to maneuver best um, and not to be sort of flapping in the wind. So like, if this is the culture, this is the way it is. But really, if I understand at least what the landscape looks like, I can understand like where my strengths are best going to be shown, right? Like the places where I'm going to have some gaps and things that I need to like kind of shore up. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, that, that really was the thing that, that kind of drove me trying to understand um, these cultures. And then Thanks. I think you had another question. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So a follow-up question for me is if you could sort of synthesize the things you were looking for into three, in three points on culture, um, whether that is what you were looking for at the time or what with hindsight, you're like, these are the questions that I should have asked or I did ask, what would those three things be? Yeah. So um, from a culture standpoint, I think it's always important to understand the power structure, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, there's hierarchy, but then there's actually also power. And so the person who's just above you may not be more powerful than you. Person mm -hmm. two people above you may not be more powerful than the person right above you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing I think that's actually really to understand um, the power structure. Um, Two, I think it's actually from a cultural standpoint important to understand like what does this culture value? Mm. Because it's important to understand if that culture works for you. And I and I loved you know Cassandra's you know um, summation after a very prestigious um, you know position to say like this just does, it doesn't actually sync up with the things that I care about. And so it's incredibly important to just understand what the culture values um, and what's important to it. Um, and then I guess the last thing that I would be looking for in the culture is, do I, do I like it? Um, and I would say over time, I, as I grew in my confidence and I probably didn't give myself enough grace, um, when I wasn't confident in the beginning of, of sort of the corporate world. Uh, but as I grew in that confidence, I became much more, um, quick and able to judge whether or not there was a portion of this culture that I was willing to participate in, or even if the organization as a whole was not something that I was interested in. So I, I guess those would be the three points. Thank you, excellent. Um, I'm thinking about how these questions, I'm answering these questions for my own organization as well. Um, so thanks so much. Manama, I'd like to come back to you. Um, you said you'd had an organic journey but you did mention that having a kid in law school did shape a, a lot of the way that you, a lot of the decisions that you've made. Um, I think from what I know of your background, there is actually quite a bit more to think about, which is in addition to having gone through law school with a kid, at some point you traded shores and you traded shores and then you decided that no, 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 I'm going to, up the ante even more and create my own law firm from scratch. So it'd be good to understand what 
did some of the, what were some of the things that having a son, I believe, um, brought up for you when you were in law school? How did it change the way that you navigated law school? How did it change the way that you navigated the US corporate sphere? How did it change or influence the times in which you took certain decisions? Well, Adjoa, you really come with the um, A-list questions today. Um, I, it, it got me to be a lot more organized. Um, I had my first child, I have four children. Mm -hmm. I had my first child um, in, at the end of my second year. So I spent my entire second year pregnant and commuting from Columbia to Long Island, which is where I was living. Uh, mm -hmm. with my husband um, and and so I had I had to be really super organized and I had to you know be very 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 strategic about everything um, so it, it, having having children and sort of managing that along with school and then later work um, has taught me to be very organized and has taught me I think to not let perfection be the enemy of the good. Mm. Uh, because if you're juggling a bunch of things, you're not going to necessarily do all of them to perfection. And so you have to really prioritize and, and think about, you know, what's good enough and, uh, you know, and then sort of be able to juggle um, very well. So I've learned to, to do that and that has served me really well in um, in setting up my own business but you had a bunch of questions in the middle there I think so I the, the, yeah that thanks this is really great I think for me how I, the, the other questions were how did this shape some of the disorder if, if you're looking at if you're looking at this from the outside how did this mm -hmm. shape some of the bolder choices you made e.g okay. moving yeah. from the U.S. stepping up your own shop yeah. So um, when I, I always knew that I wanted to move back to, to the continent and specifically to Ghana um, and I, because I wanted to have an impact. I mean, it, I had a wonderful opportunities in the US, but I knew that I wanted to come and to have an impact in Ghana. And mm -hmm. I also knew that I wanted my children to have the experience that I had of growing up um, in the majority in Ghana. I think that was very important for me when I finally made it to the US, having had that experience. It didn't occur to me that I couldn't do something because I was black. Uh, it didn't occur to me that I couldn't do something because I was a girl. Um, actually, I went to Princeton to, um, to study mathematics. Um, and so I wanted my children to know what it felt like to grow up in the majority in your, you know, their own country and to have a deep connection with Ghana. So that's what, that was a major um, part of what informed the move and the timing of the move. When I moved to Ghana, my children were um, six, four and two or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, having an impact and wanting my children to have a certain foundation was what informed um, that, that, that decision. Now, um, the decision to form my own law firm was a combination of things. So um, I, had, I had just left um, a private equity fund that I was working at mm -hmm. um, for a variety of reasons. And I wanted to, to, to do something and I didn't see, um, I didn't see any, when I looked in the landscape, I didn't see any firms that were doing, the, doing it the way I wanted to do it. Um, and so I set up my own firm. And also when you're a, when you're a parent, uh, and in my case, a parent of four children, you need flexibility. And so I wanted to set up the kind of place that would um, enable me to achieve my goals and would create an environment where similar, you know, people in, in like situation would have the opportunity to be their best selves and not have to sacrifice, um, you know, things like starting a family or yeah, developing okay. other, other interests. 
Um, that's excellent. And she's grown this, um, for those of you who don't know, she's grown this into one of the foremost law firms in the country. So, well, props to you, Nanama. Cassandra, I'd like to come back to something that you said, um, which has been swirling in the back of my head, which is you said you wanted to do something meaningful. Um, what framework did you use to identify this is meaningful, this is not? And against, especially against some of the the pressure in the backdrop that you described around the family, et cetera. How do you do that? Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, it, it was a lot of introspection. And, it, you know, um, I think when I first started off, it was around where, like when I say meaningful, what does it even mean and in what context? And I think over the course of the five years I was at Rolls-Royce, I was lucky enough to be in a graduate rotational program doing different things. And so as I did my various rotations, and I didn't even realize it at the time, you know, I think it's, there's a quote by Steve Jobs, which goes, you know, you can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking backwards. And it was about, you know, five years, or maybe four years into it that I realized that I was actually in that company for the period of time I was to figure out whatever it is I eventually figured out, which was as I was doing like a, a business development initiative for a greenfield project, the things that we were asking the community in terms of like, oh, you know, what is the government getting out of this? Are we like, you know, it's sort of like a local content policy in place and all of that. And I had grown up, in, I actually grew up in Ghana in a small mining town in Mabwase. And growing up, I think I took a lot of things for granted. But as I was in the space, I kept asking myself, you know, when the company was being set up, did we ask ourselves these questions? Because right now you look at the, the town I grew up in and you see a lot of the, the gaps that existed like back then because perhaps some questions were not asked and so you know whether it was doing a business process improvement initiative i was asking myself you know how much money could be saved if governments were more efficient if we actually did it was just a lot of questions around like what what how much more impact could my skill sets have if i placed it in the context of where I grew up. And I think those are the kinds of questions I asked myself. I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do because I have a lot of different interests. I still don't know what I want to do. Um, mm -hmm. But, and so I started asking myself, do I want to go to law school because I could become a lawyer and draft some local content policies? Do I want to go to business school? Do I like, you know, I actually try to apply and come back straight to the continent and to Ghana specifically, and it wasn't successful. So I realized that I, I really wanted to go back to, to grad school and get you know, kind of try and understand the intersection of private sector and public policy. And if the private sector is the engine of growth, then the public policy is really like the buddy, the car that really moves that engine. And I really wanted to understand how all of that works. And so meaningful for me meant really trying to do something that had a purpose that was bigger than me in a context that I thought made sense to me, which for me at the time meant Ghana. And for some reason, I think all the different experiences I had just made it so crystal clear to me that that is what I wanted to do, such that the naysayers who are my parents who had my best interest at heart, because again, I'm the firstborn, I, you know, they had made a lot of sacrifices for us to move to the US and uh, how was I going to pay for grad school? I mean, there are so many unknown questions and I think, again, I have, a, I have a thing for quotes, right? But when you really want something and you work towards it, the universe conspires to help you achieve it. So, I mean, I got a really great fellowship from Columbia, um, cashed out my 401k and, you know, and, and the rest is history. And I think with regards to how I landed in tech, um, it really was also serendipitous because I initially thought I was going to go into CSR, corporate social responsibility because of all the questions I'd asked myself previously. And uh, during between my first and second year of SIPA, I ended up doing an internship in, in Tanzania for a startup and realized that a lot of the tools we were using, like whether it was Google Forms or Google Analytics, et cetera, were all free. And essentially we were using technology. Uh, I mean, the startups were using technology to really level up and level up in a way that actually could allow them to scale. So it opened my eyes to the possibility of, of tech for good and also made me realize that I maybe I didn't need to go to grad school, but anyway, but that actually I could still be in the private sector, really doing like really impactful, positive stuff. And the lens with which I had looked at things going into grad school 
wasn't necessarily as well-rounded as I had wanted it to be, but part of it was also being, you know, doing these internships and getting on the ground experience. Um, so yeah, eventually landed back in Ghana and essentially been around the continent and meaningful to me is not static. It's, it's not a static thing, it changes. And who knows, tomorrow I might wake up and decide, you know, what meaningful for me is, is global. It's not just Africa, it's not just Ghana. And I might just step out again, I'm not sure. But right now, meaningful to me is about making a positive long lasting difference in the continent um, for now. For sharing, I think there's a question that is like on the tip of my tongue, which is how do you connect your background especially how do you bring that out in a corporate setting and help people to appreciate it, right? I've had personal experiences where I'm like, ah, if you went back to this experience I had one day walking somewhere in Kumasi, um, this is how I would think about the, this problem. But then like how much of the world understands what life is in Kumasi? How much of the world understands what life is in a small town near Kumasi? How do you make people connect to that? How do you make it relevant? By being yourself. I, I think if there's one thing I'm grateful to my parents for, it's just uh, inculcating a really great sense of self in me. And maybe it's what um, Manama was also saying, like having grown, I remember, you know, starting my job at Rolls Royce and being constantly questioned about how did your hair get so short and it's so long tomorrow and and I don't think I ever took it you know and, and in another context maybe I'd have taken it personal or anything like that but for me it was just that person is curious I'll explain to them and I'll move on and and um and maybe they meant something beside what they were saying but I never really thought deep into those things but I do think that it's important to really uh, you know, stay true to who you are, uh, regardless of the circumstances you find yourself in. And back to Nanada's point, it's important to understand the cultural setting in which you are, the, the, the company culture, but also to understand where your strengths are and your biggest strength is really being true to yourself and, and figuring out how to play to your strengths within the context of, of, of that bigger um, company. Um, I'm trying to figure out how best to answer the question, but I honestly, I just think it is really about being yourself. And, and so long as you're yourself, um, I think the rest will fall into play. So being myself has been like, you know, in any given, on any given day, in any given meeting, I'll give you a Ghanaian quote, like I'll talk about like, you know, literally mean in like, you know, in unity lies strength or, a Kwame Nkrumah quote or whatever the saying may be. So right now I work in Kenya, but I'm like forever flying the Ghana flag. Um, and I'm, I'm a very proud Ghanaian and I've never shied away from being Ghanaian. Even when I was the only black person in any given room, I think I am Ghanaian, I'm Pan-African, I'm African, I'm, I'm all of those things. And I think it's important that before you try to change the world, you really understand who you are and what your levers are and, and and really play to that. And I will pause here because I can go on and on. Yeah. All right. Um, before I ask my, my, my next question, I'll just like to signal to the audience that it's about, we're, we're coming up to the Q&A section in about 10 minutes. So please do start writing the questions that you have for the panelists in the chat so that we can get to them when the time comes. So. Cassandra, there was something else you, you mentioned which are around meaning, which has got me thinking. So you talked about discovering that you were using a lot of tech and startups were using a lot of tech to sort of lift themselves up. Um, the thing about tech that we've seen yeah. is that it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? Um, it's helping the startups on one end, it's mm -hmm. widening the gap between haves and have-nots on the other end. How are you balancing this tension in this sort of search for purpose? And what, what specifically are you doing to try yeah. to close that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a very good question. And it's a question I grapple with in my everyday work. Like, how is my work for a commercial entity, which is big on return on investments, also serving the greater good? How, and, and, and so sometimes if I'm working on a contract with an MO or I'm working on um, like a, a deal, so to speak, 
the key questions I ask myself, although it's not directly related to what I'm doing, is like, how is my work enabling someone's livelihood today? How has it facilitated their ability to connect? How has it you know, enabled digital financial inclusion and specifically to what I do in my day-to-day -day work? So as head of Android partnerships with Google, where you know, I essentially serve as a platform for Google products and services to ride on. And Android is the most prevalent form of, um, it's the most prevalent OS for mobile devices in the continent to ride on today. And we are in a continent where people's first and sometimes their only connectivity to the internet is through their mobile devices. So if I'm working on initiatives that allow for the prices of those devices to come down, I'm enabling that person down the street who is selling to actually be able to get, um, you know, whether it's uh, a mobile money uh, account to be able to become banked in the way that makes sense to them because we still have a huge population that is unbanked. And to not only do that, but to also be able to go online if they're a content creator to upload stuff on YouTube and to be able to monetize down the line. So for me, it's constantly asking myself the big picture questions about how does my work uh, really enable someone to live better? And, and at the end of the day, it's really about, yeah, you know, it's about the positive externalities, right? And yeah, you can make a case as to, you know, if we focus on this big partner, this big country to the exclusion of like smaller ones, we somewhat widen gaps. But at the end of the day, I think the way I justify to myself anyway, is that when we work on things that drive prices down, whether it's of the internet or of devices in themselves, we are closing the gap uh, and allowing people to, to thrive in, in ways that make sense to them. And so, so, so that's how I, that's how I, I guess I justify it to myself and I'm able to derive meaning from, from my work. Great, thank you. So thank you for sharing that. So I'd like to ask a few targeted questions um, and then we can open up for Q&A. So Nana, I'd like to start with you. I think we've, we've seen quite a bit about your story being published in um, some of the, some magazines, et cetera. And one of the things that really struck me was it seems your affinity for taking bold steps and for taking risks. Now, the question that I have in my mind is, well, first of all, what's your secret? And then secondly, it'd be interesting to see how you practice this in your line of work. Like, how do you pass this on to your teams? And especially when you're in such a high pressure earnings driven environment, how do you balance taking risks with the sort of the tried and true path? Yeah. Um, so as far as uh, taking risks, I, I don't think there's any secret. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm actually in some situations actually pretty risk averse. I think risk, calculated risk um, mm -hmm. is really probably the best friend of just about everybody, right? Like you, you have to go out there, but you, you can't be reckless with it. Um, mm -hmm. I would often just kind of look at my parents moving to the States um, and just doing just bold things just by um, being in different spaces and, and, and doing all the things that they did. So um, I think I had a good model. I think I also come up to things and just, I don't know, I, I think it's the mindset. Um, I think one of the panelists talked about that before. There is a mindset that if this is something I've set my mind to, then it's something that I'm going to succeed at. So um, I went to the Naval Academy and every week you, we didn't have cell phones back then. So every week they marched you down to the uh, to the pay phones and you had to call your family and my mother um, who's awesome my parents are great it was like do you want to come home because if you want to come home you can come home and there was just something inside of me that knew that I was just not going to come home like voluntarily right like I was going to finish and so you know maybe that's a little of how I'm wired but I think I think that some of these risks are not actually as risky they're just maybe maybe they're just on big stages sometimes um, and when I talk to my team so I um, worked in wealth management for over 15 years, but have recently pivoted to do um, digital product development, uh, which is phenomenal. I, I absolutely love it. Um, partly from an impact standpoint, I can, I can absolutely see like how I'm uplifting um, someone else's experience process um, and, and, and I love it. And so for us, 
Um, we're working on a, on a pretty high profile product for the business. And I think when you're doing something impactful as a leader, if you're tentative, if you're timid about it, you know in your gut you're not going to get the best outcomes because you need people to feel like it is okay if they say something that they might think is stupid because it actually might be brilliant, right? In the context of what we're doing, if we're being really creative and we're being really innovative, like I need you to know that even if it's not your expertise, right? Maybe it's the person's next to you, but listening to the conversation, you say, well, what if we did this? I need to foster an environment where people can know that they can say, well, what if we did this? And that I won't laugh at them, that I won't chastise them, that I won't talk over them. And so in that way, I think I empower people to be bold, right? And to take some risks because they know it's going to be okay. And when I get something wrong, um, the other day I got something wrong in one of our meetings and it, it, was, it was nothing crazy, but people let me go on with this for a while until one person, because I, I mixed up where somebody was from. They're from Bulgaria and I was, I was talking about something I saw in Hungary. And finally, someone's like, well, but I mean, if they were Hungarian, I guess they would know that. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I said, Dima is the only person who was brave enough to actually call me out on this. I was like, this is ridiculous. How long have I been talking about this, right? And so as a leader, if I don't let somebody do something bold to me when I've done something, right? Like they're not gonna know that that's okay. So even though that's like a little example, like if you're doing that professionally when it comes with a project or something you're trying to execute, I think you all of a sudden create a team full of people that are very comfortable in a space that they haven't been in but feel very confident that they can figure it out. Got it, very clear. So making, give, making, creating a safety net at work for people to be able to shine and take risks themselves. Very clear. Um, so Ajo, I'd like to come to you. Um, you've talked a lot about having to be resilient against people, but also being open to opportunities, et cetera. I'd like to really understand how you re, how you leverage mentors and sponsors in being open to these opportunities and what did you decide to share and how did you make those decisions with, about what to share and what not to share mm, okay all right so um along my journey um and seeking out mentors um Definitely, you know, um, having like a, sh a shared vision um, with my mentor and actually one of my most influential mentors um, was uh, before I started med school, um, I had a, a, a professor who actually was of, of Jamaican descent, but he also, um, he was a cell biology professor. He also did research in Ghana. And so, um, so uh, before I started med school, you know, we, we uh, he actually, he, he kind of like took a, like a personal interest in, in students. So, you know, if you would come to his, uh, to his office hours, you just start chatting. And so um, he actually gave me the opportunity to go back to Ghana for my, my second um, trip, um, you know, with, uh, well, this was the only time that I traveled without my parents. So just, you know, being open to, um, uh, you know, making that connection, uh, you know, typically, you know, people don't really kind of connect on a personal level with the professor, but kind of, you know, just, you know, uh, uh, being bold and just, you know, um, uh, just, just, just taking that risk and, you know, being open to, to different opportunities. Um, so yeah, throughout, um, you know, my journey, uh, I can also give an example of a, of a mentor that I connected with, um, um, uh, that uh, had a similar interest in women's health. Um, and so when I was trying to decide what, what uh, you know, uh, future fellowship training I wanted to, um, to begin, um, I connected with, with mentors who, you know, kind of were, weren't doing the most popular, um, um, you know, clinical work. You know, they, they did work around um, women's reproductive justice and helping women get access to uh, all, all comprehensive sources of family planning. And um, so, you know, being able or, or, or not being, or just, just being um, comfortable with being uncomfortable, 
you know, so, um, you know, just, just, you know, just um, being okay with, with not doing, a, you know, not taking a typical journey or, or typical pathway and just, you know, finding mentors who, you know, this particular mentor actually wasn't even um, at my same um, hospital um, rotation site. It was a, 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 you know, a mentor that I, that I found where I was just doing an elective, a short-term elective. So, you know, just, just, just making those connections and, you know, foster, fostering those connections and, and nurturing them um, has really, um, you know, um, like, like really uh, assisted in, in, in my own um, leadership path, you know, making bold decisions uh, as well. You know, um, that also has been part of my, my journey with um, mentors and just overall. Great, thank you so much. Then my last question, then we go to Q&A, goes to both Cassandra and Nanama in that order. So do you have a life? Um, you have this brilliant career, and you've had a lot of excellent things that you've, you've done and about how you're deliberate about doing these things, but like, are you a human being? How do you actually make it happen? I guess I'll, I'll go. Um... Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very much a human being, uh, a human being making human beings, I should say. <laughs> uh, I, I have two little ones. I have a three-year-old and a, a seven-month-old. And I, I think I'm probably where Nama was maybe when she was in, in law school, where she was asking herself big questions about, you know, the kinds of where she wanted to raise her kids and how she wanted to raise her kids and the opportunities she wanted to provide them. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm back to sort of the drawing board in terms of defining what meaningful is to me with regards to what, you know, sort of centered around the kids and, and, and what I, I guess I would like for that to be. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm lucky to have a partner in crime in the form of my husband who kind of puts up with me and uh, has put up with me jumping all over Africa the last few years. And, and, and now I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to stay still a little bit, but outside of that, um, I think I, I, I have a seven month old, so I haven't really had much of an outside life besides work and, and her, but prior to that, I used to play tennis. I do kickbox from time to time and uh, mentor when I can, uh, but yeah, right now, just, uh, just being with family and outside of work, it's just family, I guess, yeah. And then I'm a... Yes, I'm definitely a human being. Um, <clears throat> All my colleagues at work will attest to that. Um, I play tennis, I cook, I, I mentioned my four children. Uh, I have wonderful friends that I, you know, I'm in touch with and we get together whenever we can. Um, it's very important to have a full life. Um, you can't wait to finish, you know, one thing in order to enjoy the fullness of life. So for me, I think one of the things that I, I make an effort to do is to is to fill fit everything in with with the work that I have to do so that I'm not I don't have regrets down the line that I didn't do this and I didn't do that so I, I yeah I definitely have fun in addition to working very hard okay so well from both of you I'm, I'm getting do it all and Nanama, I'll, I'll repeat something that you said earlier, is don't let perfect be the enemy of good. So do it all, make sure you have fun um, while you're at it. And I think something that I've picked up from Cassandra is it's okay for you to sort of, for this to be flexible. Um, sometimes having a life means spending time with your seven month old and sometimes it's kickboxing and doing tennis and mentoring. And that balance is fluid. Thank you so much, ladies. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. I'd like to hand over to Ruth, who will take us through the Q&A from the audience. So Ruth. Thank you, Adwa. And again, thank you all the panelists. Um, this has actually been a really interesting event hearing from you all. I'm so inspired and I hope others are as well. The first question we have is for Cassandra. Um, from what you've described, how come data is so expensive in Ghana? And um, is there a way to bring the prices down so that the average Ghanaian would be able to afford it? Uh, 
how do I answer that question? Um, so, I mean, the price of data is a function of, of, of several things. Uh, I think <laughs> perhaps, I think that Nanama is now sitting on the board of, of Scancom, so maybe she can chime in here. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it, it is it, it is a, a constantly uh, evolving um, topic, but to the best of our abilities, I think, whether it's the telcos, whether it's, um, you know, the wholesale providers or even the ISPs, everyone is, as far as I know, really working to try and make sure that we can get prices down. Um, I think when it comes to data or the internet, there is a supply and demand equation at play. So on one hand, you want to make sure that you recoup the investments you made, whether it's in your 4G networks and whatnot. And for that to happen, you have to have a lot of people migrate from using their basic phones, like which is a 2G devices feature phones to smartphones to actually get data ARPU, like the average revenue per user up. And so it is a function. And, and right now we have the majority of people across Africa are still on feature phones. And that's sort of where my work is right now, trying to speed up the migration from feature phones to smartphones to ensure that people are getting the return on investment they've made in like the 4G networks to try and drive prices down. So it is, it, it's not a, it's not, drive prices down and it even fixes the equation because they could drive it down but they can't get the return on investment they've made because people are not really optimally using the data and i think i draw you also worked at airtel for a bit so you can talk to, i you know, no I, no I, no today is all you Sandra. today yeah. is all you. Uh, no it's, it's it's a lot of different parts but um yeah to the best of my knowledge i i you know i'd like to think that we're in it together and that the different parties at play are really trying to get prices down but in order for that to happen there needs to be the demand bit needs to get sorted out let me just piggyback on that actually i did work at that and i did work on data actually specifically um i think katandra is spot on on this supply and demand part of it i think being realistic telcos face a lot of costs period and a lot of those costs are denominated in um currencies that the cd typically is not stronger than and so that already puts you at a bit of a disadvantage in trying to claw back or trying to reduce the pricing i think that said the telcos are on, on a bit of a journey at least that's my perspective of the experience mm -hmm. i've had learning what really matters to customers and learning how to make money out of those things in the right ways but definitely people are thinking about, look, there's a lot of competition in telco and you, you need to try to drop your price because someone else will do it for you. And so that's something that I expect is top of mind and probably Nanama can tell people more if they, if they really care about it in detail. Okay, thank you, Adwa and Cassandra for chiming in on that. Our next question is from a graduate student who's wondering how he can transition back to school and um, for his job passion, his salary, and even further studies. Um, he's wondering if it's necessary to take a hiatus to recognize himself and, you know, sort of debrief first. And so this is to all of you. Um, I, I would say that, you know, Taking a hiatus would be dependent on, you know, your financial circumstances. If you're able to take a hiatus, uh, then that's a great thing to do and to, to focus on your on your studies. It's, it's difficult to study and work at the same time. I've done it. When I did my MBA, I was also working a full time job um, and, and that was that was challenging. But um, yeah, so I would say if you can take a hiatus, if it's financially feasible, then that, that is a good thing to do. It also depends on what your graduate study is, because there are some uh, courses that are complemented by working concurrently. So, yeah, yeah I, I agree. Um, um, you know, sometimes uh, you need to uh, take a break and to really kind of figure out um, your path. Um, but yeah, I also, uh, while I was at Columbia actually getting my, my master's in public health, I was, you know, full-time um, uh, fellow, I was working and, you know, it wasn't easy, but, um, you know, um, if, if, 
if the 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 the, the um if you're able to you know have maybe uh, do a fellowship where you're actually sponsored uh, and your tuition is paid for your books are paid for um, that is, is certainly helpful and then you can you know balance out um, you know still working and having um, some sort of income so you know just leveraging any opportunity that comes before you but um, but yeah sometimes a, a hiatus is definitely necessary to really regroup and you know really really focus Thank you, Ajwa. Um, our next question is, how can one express and optimize one's personal brand? Nana, that you're shaking your head, you wanna take this question? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so I, I think that there are, I guess the way that I would think about this, it, it goes back to, kind of what Cassandra was talking about in, in just being yourself. And so um, I think one danger, right? And I, I did say before, when you're looking at, when I look at culture and it's like, how are you trying to like fit into this culture? You don't want to fit so much into this culture, right? That you, you kind of meld into it, right? It's more in that way of trying to understand like what your strengths are and like how you can, how you can apply them and all that good stuff. But there are some things that are um, pretty pivotal to, to your essence, right? Like how it is you want to be perceived. Like if you want to ask, if you would ask the question, like, how do I think people perceive me or what do I want to be known for? Um, and then you just kind of be intentional about that. And that's actually how you build a brand um, by doing those things so that they are visible. And it's not the point of being visible just to be visible because that, that feels kind of slimy. Um, but it is being very intentional that if I'm in this certain situation, I want to make sure that I'm speaking up in a way that is consistent with the brand that I want to create for myself. But you do have to start with like, what is that brand, right? And so whether it's how you want people to interpret you or just what you want to put out, right? Like ev everyone's a little different. And so they may think of it um, from that standpoint. And then I would also say there's probably things just to do outside of work, maybe in that corporate environment. Um, that also speak volumes about like who you are. So the division that I work in um, at JP Morgan, um, I started uh, an organization that's called the Black Leadership Forum, co-founded it with two other people. And it's now a fantastic platform for lots of different types of conversation um, for allies and also for the Black employees in our division and outside. And I was doing it out of a place of passion and impact and what was important to me, but it is an activity that spoke to my brand about the things that I care about as far as diversity and inclusion. And so there's things that you're just going to do that are going to be an extension of who you are. And then there are things that are going to be around the qualities that you want to display in your brand um, that you can that you can sort of speak to in an activity on a daily basis. Thank you, Nana. Um, I, would, I, I just have something quick to add on this. Oh, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think for me, you know, very important to to be consistent, you know, and so I think people need to be thoughtful in all aspects of their life uh, that they they are being consistent and being true to, you know, certain core values. Um, and I think that's how, you know, you, 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 you build um, an authentic brand. Um, and in your personal life, you know, let, let the things that you're doing in your personal life, how you are showing up on social media, how you are showing up in various places, uh, let all of that be consistent. Thank you, Nanama. Does anybody else want to chime in before I move to the next question? about personal branding. We've had a few questions about that and um, understanding the culture and how it works. All right, we'll move to the next question. What tactics do you adopt to quickly understand a new working environment to set yourself up for success? Now you're nodding your head and since you're on, can you take that up? <laughs> I think I think what I would what I used to do was to and what I still do 
was to look at the people who are successful in that environment. Look at the people who are successful in that environment and look at what they are doing uh, and how it's received. Look at the people that you uh, can relate to in that environment um, and, and then find, find a way to be yourself, but to, but to, but to take into consideration some of the, the things that the people who are successful in that environment are doing. But I generally will read the situation by looking at the people who are doing well in that environment. Does anyone else on the panel want to chime in on that? Um, so I'll just add a little bit. I, it's, it's probably just um, Cassandra, Cassandra, we lost you. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on to the next question and we can come back to that. Sorry, Cassandra on. Um, another question is, how do I connect with any of you in case of mentorship opportunities and guidelines for someone who's currently a student in level 200, which is more year over here? Cassandra, we'll back to you. Sorry, I was asking a question. Oh, you oh sorry. Lose you, yes. Um, so you can I wonder what point since you're on now how do why how about you um answer the question and then I'll repeat the other question that I just asked go ahead you know, okay I don't know where I got got lost but I was essentially just agreeing with what Anama said but but just adding that um I'm a big believer that you know mentorship doesn't always have to be a top down or bottom up uh, kind of thing. You can always find mentors who are your peers as well. Um, if you join a, an organization or a company and you're trying to um, essentially succeed in, um, in, in the place, you can look to see people who are probably at your level or slightly higher. It could even be someone who's below you, but the person is doing really well and you admire particular traits about them. It's, it's just as well you can, you know, really ask for have conversations with them about about what they're doing well and what you can lean on them for and in those cases most of my biggest mentors have actually not been like formal mentors they've been people that i've admired and that i've had developmental conversations with in specific areas i wanted to get better at um so i do think that you know there is something to be said about like a, a reciprocal mentorship of sorts Thank you, Cassandra. And this is actually um, very similar to the other question we have, which is someone trying to connect with any of the panels or anybody on this um, event to find mentorship opportunities and guidelines. Current, currently in um, level 200, which is um, sophomore year. So is, are you guys open to connecting with people in the audience um, who would like for you to mentor them or give them guidance. Max, we've had a few questions um, similar to that, how people can connect with you. Well, I'm, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, my law firm's website is um, www.ndowuona.com. Uh, and um, you know, you're very welcome to submit um interests uh in employment through the website or find me on linkedin great anybody else on the panel who's open to taking some mentors yeah absolutely please feel free you can reach out to me on linkedin mentees okay yeah, yeah me, and, me as well you can find me on linkedin <laughs> Okay, so in the interest of time, we'll ask two questions and then we'll round up. Um, so another question is, how do you stay true to your authentic self? I think it was um, Cassandra earlier on who was talking about being authentic, but how do you stay true to your authentic self? In a world where you're being pulled in different directions, as women especially, we're being judged by how we look, what we do, um, and whatnot. So how do you stay true to your authentic self and find that voice? Mm. 
Um, I, I, I use to... my, sorry, go ahead. No, please um, go. Oh, I, I was gonna um, just like, okay, I'll just, just make this quick. Um, you know, being, you know, true to yourself, you know, tr trusting your, 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 your voice and your vision. And, um, and sometimes even being, um, uh, not being afraid of being um, unliked. Um, Chimamanda Adichie, one of my favorite authors has a quote about how women are kind of, um, you know, groomed to worry so much about likability. And sometimes you have to make, um, you know, hard decisions and, you know, people uh, may label you as being, you know, difficult, you know, for women, women who are outspoken uh, or who make tough decisions are, are, you know, labeled as aggressive. So, you know, just being, um, you know, a truth to your, to, you know, trusting in your knowledge and what you believe and, um, you know, having evidence to back up, you know, whatever you feel is, are, are the best decisions. And, you know, sometimes people might not like you or they might label you. I mean, I've been called like, oh, you're, you're spicy. And, you know, if, if you don't kind of like follow the grain, people will have these kind of negative perceptions, but, you know, um, you know, just be true to yourself and, and what you believe, you know, what you believe and what you know is, is right. And, you know, sometimes that's enough. People might not like you, but, you know, that's okay. <laughs> I was gonna. I was gonna say that um, I think it, it's worthwhile cultivating um, a good sense of for for how it feels when you're being authentic, and then noticing how it feels when you are not being authentic. And and generally, um, you know, when you are not being true to yourself, you, if you're thoughtful and if you are still you can feel that you that it can create some level of anxiety or disquiet. So I think for me, what I, what I do try to do is when I'm feeling anxious or when I'm feeling uncomfortable, it is a cue for me to look at, you know, what it is that I'm doing, how I'm showing up in the, in the, in the situation and to see whether that's coming up because I'm not uh, listening to my inner voice. Thank you, Nanama. So we have a few questions. I'll try and put them all in one so that everyone can at least you know, get some of their questions um, answered. How do you embody self-confidence and assert yourself? And another question is, what was that final decision that made you transition from one career to the other or move from um, the US to Ghana or um, the US to Tanzania and what have you? So, which one do you want to make before I just pick someone? Okay. Go ahead, Nana. Nana. I, I, think on the, I think on the confidence thing, it just goes back to what, you know, a number of people have said, which is you, you are most confident when you're, when you're being yourself. Uh, trying to be somebody other than that is, is a deeply uncomfortable thing. And... And so I think confidence comes from, you know, accepting yourself and, and showing up as yourself and not pretending to be somebody else. Um, so I, that was my two cents on, on confidence. Yeah, and I think the other thing I'll add on confidence as well is um, there's, there's one thing to be said about being yourself. If, if I were to... Yeah, go quickly. Can you hear me? Uh-oh. Yes, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. okay. No, I was saying that there's one thing to be said about um, being, you know, even when you're being yourself, there's always room to improve, right? So I, I can say, for example, that I... Uh, I'm an introvert who really gets uh, like this panel is going to drain me after this because it takes a lot for me to sit on these things and, and to engage and all. But I put myself out there because the more I put myself out there, I get better at it. Right. And so I think there's something to be said about building comfortable by getting uncomfortable, uh, by getting comfortable with uncomfortable situations that ultimately pay off in the long run. Because sometimes when we also, you know, when we 
talk about being yourself and you're naturally a reserved person, it is okay to be that way, but sometimes it does hold you back. And sometimes you've got to put yourself in uncomfortable positions in order to build your confidence muscle, if I should say so myself. Um, and the second part of the question was really around what was around the move to Ghana and what was the mm. question exactly? Yeah, the move to Ghana or how you transition from one career to the other. Uh, sorry, Ruth, okay. Ruthanne, sorry, Cassandra, one second. On the, on, yes. Sorry, on the confidence thing, I think the, the I think the thing we're all not saying is you've got to be prepared. Be very, very, very well prepared, extremely well prepared. So that, that helps a lot. And, and the only other thing I would add on the confidence thing is, is oftentimes we are, we don't have the confidence because we've already sort of swallowed something that we think is coming our way that's negative, right? And so you, you combat that by A, being prepared, right? Like that's one of those things, but but you know, if you've got all your ducks in a row and whatever it is that's negative is not actually true, then like rationally, and we know that self-confidence is not a rational thing, but rationally, there should be no reason why you can't come out there with the level of confidence that everything that you're projecting should, should garner, right? And so I think we do almost have to rewrite the things that are living in our heads about some of the negative things that might challenge us in certain situations when in fact um i'm not naive to the fact that people have certain thoughts but like we don't have to embody those right and so as the doctor said you may get labeled as you know a little you know too confident at times but let that be the problem then then hanging back mm. and talk slowly <laughs> yeah, so now we can go back to the question of how did you transition from either one career to the other or um, from one position to the other, be it a promotion or um, just, you know, taking a leap of faith and moving from two different fields. You know, some of you have transitioned from the finance sector to law, from law to finance, from sociology to med school um, and what have you. So what has been some of the key or core decisions that made you make those transitions. Yeah, I, I was actually just looking for this paper of mine because I'm 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 kind of at a pivotal pivotal point in right now, and I'm trying to map out um, all the different variables I'm optimizing for and ranking them. And, and this is probably too uh, analytical, but so the way I look at it, right. In, in different at different points in life you're optimizing for different things right you could be optimizing for geography and say you know what i don't want to leave the us i want to stay here but i want to transition jobs and so are you optimizing for personal growth are you optimizing to have a large impact within the company are you optimizing to have a large impact externally are you optimizing because you want to have a path to people management uh if you're like an individual contributor uh, are you up to, uh, I mean, are you uh, transitioning because you want to travel more? And I'm, I'm using my examples right now in terms of what I'm looking at, but at different, you know, at different points in life, there are different things that you might rank higher in terms of what you're optimizing for. So when I was, you know, when I made the decision to move to Ghana, geography or Africa, geography was like top there. And I knew comp was going to get a, a huge hit but it wasn't as big a factor for me because I really just wanted to move back. Uh, and maybe it wouldn't have been a big hit, but it wasn't like my number one factor. Uh, family, all of those things were in there. So I think at different points in life, uh, and then when I, I moved here and I wanted to like have a more broader Pan-African career, I was optimizing for growth and I really wanted to be compensated better. And so those then were like, you know, like the things I looked at. Um, but I think what, one of if i look back um just all the way back to like Rolls royce and a couple of different things i went through um i also want to say in all of this and i know it gets said a lot that we should really be willing to embrace failure and the lessons that come with it and failure doesn't have to be like some big you know thing where you like feel like you're sinking or anything like that so i for me what the tipping point was 
a, a, a bad performance review I got, which I didn't think I deserved. And so that got me really thinking about a whole bunch of things and thinking um, about what I could do better, but in, in do, and trying to do better, I then asked myself, wow, if I've been able to really turn the narrative around this to such like a positive trajectory and I still feel like something is missing, then what is that? And that really got me to kind of reflect back and retro retrospectively I understand that when I was asking myself those questions about whether it's local content or processes or whatever, like that moment in time happened so, such that all of those things could make sense. And so I'm saying a lot of things here, but I'm just trying to say that it's important to know what you're optimizing for. And it's also okay to, to fail and to really embrace that failure and to learn from it and to fall forward from it. Um, so anyway, yeah. I, I, I love that. If I could just chime in. I think that um, I've never heard it put that way, like what you're trying to optimize for, but I think that's exactly right. In my last pivot from covering clients and focusing in investments to doing digital product development, like that in itself doesn't sound like it makes much sense. But what I did was I just made a list, like what are the things that I like to do functionally? And what are the things that I would like to learn how to do that I haven't hit yet in my career? And once I looked at that list, I was able to recognize a role that embodied those. Things. And so the fact that it was a little bit of periphery to what I was doing didn't bother me because I knew that I would get the things that I was looking to optimize. So I, I think that's a that's a wonderful framework to think about it when you're thinking about pivoting. For me, I had the opportunity to go into a completely new area when I when I went to work in a private equity fund. And at the time that I was approached, my fledgling law practice was just coming into its own and growing, growing really nicely. So I really had to sit down and think. And ultimately, what made me decide to, to try. Uh, the to take up the opportunity was regret you know it was such an incredible opportunity that I knew that if I didn't do it I would always wonder what if I had gone down that path and so for me sometimes it's um, I will explore things because I know that if I don't I will always have that question and I never I, I don't generally want to have that um, that uh, question in my mind Okay, with that said, we'll wrap up for tonight. Thank you all so much, um, especially to our panelists for sharing your experiences, your talents, uh, especially for our inaugural event. I'd also like to thank Paul Lindbeck of the Columbia Association who really helped us create all these events, and the committee members from the events team, myself, Nanama, who's also a panelist, Adrian Banfo, Kofi Anku, um, Baba Yangsin and Cindy, who have also helped to put this together. We're very, very fortunate to have you all and very thrilled that we've been able to pull this off. So enjoy your evening and thank you all for joining us. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you guys nice on, to on WhatsApp. All. all right. See you all on WhatsApp. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> yeah, Paul uh, thank, thank you, you so much. No, yeah. no, thank, you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. This is great. Yes, thank Bye. you again. Thank you. Hi. I think Ruth, you need to close it out. You can, you're the, you're the host, so you, you can end it if you'd like.